Ah, good morning. It's Kill You With Truth, Chuckle at Pain. Uh, Nate Jackson will not be joining us today. Unfortunately, he's got some uh, personal stuff to deal with, and we wait the arrival of our guy, Chad Brown. Um, but we're here to talk about the NFL and the Broncos, and uh, we're doing it with you, and we bring in Chad right now. Good morning, Chad Brown. How are good you? Good morning, Darren McKee. Yeah, we have no uh, Nate. He's got some stuff to deal with, but that happens, so no problem. Always enjoy just rapping with my guy. Um, the uh, mock draft situation. What do you think of mock drafts, Chad, in general? And I have Mel Kuyper's latest and greatest to uh, go into, but what do you think about him in general? They are a fascinating look into the draft process, um, and I think – now, obviously, it's, this is the media who's doing this, but a lot of these guys are getting the information from NFL scouts and NFL yeah. GMs and coaches. So there's a certain bit of truth to it. There's a certain bit of bullshit to it because these guys are feeding them bad information. And there's a certain bit of, oh, I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. So I, And I think, in general, that kind of reflects the overall draft process. As crazy as it sounds, this you know, multi-billion dollar organization – when they are procuring new talent for their on-the-field operations, there's a certain bit of, yep, we know exactly what we're doing. There's a certain bit of lies and bullshit, and there's a certain bit of, uh, you know, we hope it works out. Right. You know, the the thing that amazes me is, like, nobody ever gets it completely right. It never happens that way. But there is an amazing amount of accuracy with the names in the first round. Like it, it is pretty crazy. Like it, it's, we say these names over and over again and inevitably Chad, it, it is those names, not necessarily in that order. Who knows how it really goes, but you're not that far off from say the 32 guys that are taken in the first round. Not really. Once in a while, there's a name that stinks in. That's just like, Holy cow. But in general, you know, the names that we're talking about, they are going to get drafted and they are going to get drafted in the first round. In general, that that is true. That is true. But uh, that comes to that's the draft order. But then we start extrapolating success, not mm -hmm. just the draft order, but success. I think the draft order it gets honed in, and it's and I think there are coaches and general managers who do who do the picking who may not love the guy they're drafting, but they don't want to be called an idiot, and right. you, you shouldn't right. pass on this guy. I mean, right. how right. many thirties for thirties can there be? about all the teams that passed on Randy Moss. Right. You know what I mean? That, that's right. always going to be a thing. And all those GMs have to live with that. So there are draft picks that will happen later this month that will not be based on knowledge of the player, that will not be based on their own gut feelings, that will be based on the desire to not be wrong rather than desire to be correct. One of my favorite draft moments was actually the second round. So me and Alfred are broadcasting from inside the Broncos facility. We were allowed to do that at the time, like inside the field house. And it was the second round. And I don't know, man. I'm, I'm, yeah, you know me, I'm a mile long, three inches deep. You know, it's just like, you know. And I just went to, um, it was just maybe five, five or so minutes away from the Broncos selecting their second round pick. And Alfred, of course, is great. And he's got all sorts of opinions about everything under the sun. And I just go to ESPN and I, you know, best available player, right? Just like, I don't know, who, who are they saying is next? And it's Cortland Sutton. So I go on the air, I'm looking at ESPN's thing. And I go, Al, I really think it's going to be Cortland Sutton. <laughs> and I just start talking about, Cor I don't know if I'd ever seen, I definitely hadn't seen Cortland Sutton play because he played at SMU, and I, I, uh, I just didn't know anything about Cortland Sutton. The fact that I could pronounce his name was probably somewhat of a miracle. And sure enough, a few minutes later, Broncos select Cortland Sutton, and I'm like, how bad would I be if? And that's when I came up with just uh, auto draft. Like, how bad would you be as a GM if you simply just would auto draft with every single pick? Would, would it really be that much worse than anything you could do? Best player available, auto draft, you know, let a computer pick for you? Uh, for the teams who have the best draft records, that would probably be worse. But for the teams who have the worst draft records, that would be better. So while I wasn't with you, with you and Al, when you guys did that draft, I certainly saw Corlin Sutton play. When he played at SMU, I called some of his games, so I knew he was a pretty dynamic player, uh, you know, big body, able to do 50-50 balls in the end zone. So he was a, 
I thought he was a good draft pick for the Broncos. Now, I, I was with you and Alfred, all three of us together, at uh, that restaurant in Cherry Creek when okay. Derek Wolf was drafted. And we were all like, who the hell is this guy? And suddenly, <laughs> we're digging into draft manuals and we're looking up on the computer because we had no idea, we had never heard his name before. Right. And that's when the Broncos traded out of the first round. Yep. You want to talk about a deflating draft day experience when your team and you have been talking about this shit for months and you're, and it's a later pick. And whenever the Broncos have been lucky enough to draft their first pick overall in the twenties, that's a lot of work. It's a lot. Cause right now I just kind of stop at 12. Then I casually filter through 13, 14, whatever. But you know, I don't know the guys that are expected to go in the twenties. Not really Chad. I'll just be honest with you. I haven't gotten that deep. I don't really care. Some of the names I'm like, Oh, I used to see this guy in the top 10. Now he's in the twenties or sometimes I just stop scrolling around 15. Uh, no joke. So when your guys are in the twenties, you're doing so much more work because you, you have to understand just more dudes and more possibilities. And it gets kind of weird when you're drafting 25, 26. So you do all that work and then you're, you do, I couldn't believe it. I'm like, nobody we're trading out of the first round, Chad. Of course, that was an LA decision that right uh, again, you know, worked out, you know, worked out on the field, off the field. It didn't work out with Wolf whatsoever. Not at all. No, off no. the field. But on the field, <laughs> it was all right. Right. All right. With all that being said, um, Mel Kuyper has his uh latest mock draft that's out this morning, and he does involve trades and he does have, for me, a disappointing pick. So let's go through it. Caleb Williams, Bears, uh, Jaden Daniels, Commanders. Is Jaden Daniels trying to, what is he doing? He's putting out some weird tweets. It's It looks like he had like a bad meeting or something with the Commanders, Chad, and he wants to play for the Patriots. Did you, did you see some of that stuff yesterday? I have not seen that one. Okay. All right. Well, there's something weird going on there, but he's from the, DC area. So, anyways, Mel's got him going to uh, the Commanders. Drake May to the Patriots at three, and Marvin Harrison Jr. and the Cardinals staying put at four. Do you think the Cardinals stay put or dra- or, or trade out of that spot? Uh, I think the Cardinals. You know, there's. I've seen both scenarios. I've seen them trade out, and I've seen them take Marvin Harrison Jr. Uh, I lean towards them taking Marvin Harrison Jr. I, again. I saw him play a number of times last year. He was the best player in college football that I saw. Um, and to pass on that, uh, now, of course, they are a team that has lots of holes. So if they see their holes superseding the benefit of Marvin Harrison Jr. and his ability to help them get better immediately this year with a quarterback who certainly needs a target and for a team that's very wide receiver poor, uh, you know, maybe they see themselves and more humbly than even we do. And they recognize one receiver, a dependent position. We can say that now that Nate's not here um, versus the benefit of accumulating more overall draft picks. Maybe they do recognize that they are in a bad spot roster wise and one player is not going to be enough to move the needle forward. Well, then Mel goes on to have his first trade. This podcast is presented by Ed Pray the Real Estate, the number one trusted team in real estate in Colorado, edprather.com. He sold my home. He'll sell yours. He's got a great team, Dom and the three A's, Ashley, Abby, and Andrea, all help put it together to sell my home and buy another one. We uh, move on May 17th or so, so we're renting our own home, and it's quite an experience, and I could not have a better team around me than Ed Prather. Ed Prather. Dot com. The trade has Minnesota trading up with the uh, Chargers to take J.J. McCarthy. Now, we're all anticipating the Vikings do this, right? Why would they accumulate a first-round pick from Texans if they weren't going to trade up and they didn't want a quarterback? Who they trade up with, Chad, I guess is anybody's guess. But all right, fine. You know, that that makes sense for the Chargers to get a little bit more capital and J.J. McCarthy. So that's four quarterbacks in the top five. What do you think the likelihood of that happening is? Uh, I think that would be that would be a record. 
that would be a record. So um, there's been years where these things have been discussed in the past and the draft falls pretty funny. Um, I think the the guys who seem to have the most consensus around them from the quarterback position is Caleb Williams. And at this point, it's Jaden Daniels. He seems to be more of a consensus pick than Drake May. Um, so if Drake's not going to be the number two guy and he's moved into the number three spot, well, how far down has he fallen? And if he's number three, then J.J. McCarthy, who's only thrown 700 passes in college, is he really as thought of as highly as we in the media seem to think he, he's thought of? Mm. Uh, you know, I watched uh, J.T. O'Sullivan's quarterback school yesterday. Oh, draft nice. edition. Um, oh, oh, wow. And he, okay. And he had Bo Nix way down the line. There was a lot of things about Bo Nix's game that he didn't love. Mm. And he had to echo a lot of things that we've heard about J.J. McCarthy and that there's just not enough tape there's not enough college experience for you to make a pure evaluation. It becomes a projection. These other guys have enough on tape where you're just evaluating on based on what they've done in the field. For JJ, it's all about the projection process. And so how do you see his 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 angle, his trajectory? Is it a 10% improvement? Is it a 25% improvement? Does he take off at 45%? How much of that improvement is going to happen? Um, so I'm – more uncertain now than I was a month ago um, oh, wow. because I was based on mine on what I saw on tape and what I saw when I was calling games live. Now we're talking about projections and we're talking about fit and we're talking about teams moving up in the draft and how they see and value guys. It's yeah. Fuck if I know. Well, that's interesting. We'll get to that in a second going through this mock. Uh, Malik Neighbors, six to the Giants, seven, the Titans take Joe Alt. So he'd be the first offensive lineman taken. He is kind of the consensus number one guy out of Notre Dame. Falcons take Dallas Turner. He's a, a well-regarded outside linebacker, pass rusher. Roma Dunze, wide receiver, Washington, going nine to the Bears. Ten, the Jets take Brock Bowers. So Bowers is, is regarded universally as the top tight end. But just the way things are clogged up, he is falling probably further than he should for how he's regarded, Chad. I think there's a fear uh, after the whole Kyle Pitts thing of taking a tight end in the top five picks. Yeah. There's a concern there. Um, I think Bowers is a generational guy. I think he's, you know, Gronk-esque. Uh, not going to probably, you know, I can't guarantee he's going to wear a gold jacket like Gronk will, but he's Gronk-esque. And he has that ability to, you know, be a full-time tight end. And again, I thought about his fit for the Denver Broncos. If they can't get the quarterback they want, because he's going to be open in the middle of the field and he becomes a chess piece for Sean Payton, who doesn't provide the tell to the defense, whether it's going to be run or pass. Well, it's an interesting scenario here because with the Broncos at 12 and in this scenario with Bowers dropping, which I do wonder if other teams want to move up, maybe to get him that are satisfied with their quarterback. And the Bears just sticking at nine? I don't know, man. If Why wouldn't the Bears gain a little bit more capital? I think that nine spot is ripe. I think if you wanted to move up, you could put something together. And I was talking to some birdies behind the scenes, Chad. And I think it's more likely the Broncos move up than move back, not because George Payton would want to do that, but because Sean Payton would be more interested. Maybe. But that all depends if they want a quarterback or not. Mel's got the Chargers taking J.C. Latham offensive tackle out of Alabama as they switch with Minnesota. So that leaves the Broncos. Now, you don't have Bowers on the board. You don't have the four quarterbacks. You don't have um, the best pass rusher. You do Dallas Turner. You do have Jared Verse, um, and you've got every cornerback in the world, plus you got Knicks and Penix. What do you think Mel Kuyper does in this particular situation? The Broncos have done nothing at quarterback. Nothing. Um, and it's just hard to imagine a quarterback centric coach like Sean Payton would not at least try to get somebody in the draft. It's it's just difficult to fathom. Right. Um, so he goes for a quarterback and it's Bo Nix. That's exactly the way I see it too. I mean, exactly. The, the thing that Sean Payton would put all this time and effort into this quarterback shit and they need a quarterback. To to think that you've got Knicks or Penix, they're sitting there, you didn't move up, you're at 12, and Mel Kuyper's got him taking Quinion Mitchell, a cornerback out of Toledo. 
And, and I, I seriously, what time is the bus passing in front of my house so I can step in front of it? If, if that actually <laughs> happens. And, and then Mel, this is just so, I, I respect Mel Kuyper, but this is idiotic. I, I am telling you, I will be stunned if a scenario like this happens, Chad, with Sean Payton in charge. Now, with George Payton in charge, sure. I mean, okay. Or Vic Fangio around or or VJ in charge, but really it's Elway. I mean, whatever. But you mean to tell me, and man, dude, I am finding stuff out behind the scenes about Russell Wilson and how he was regarded by folks in the building. They are not Russell Wilson fans. They think he's Can't wait dis- to hear about it. Well, they just think, I mean, it's kind of odd. They think he's disingenuous. Basically, they think he's a liar uh, about stuff. They think that, you know, the whole way he and his agent sort of set up the, you know, you're going to be benched and or take the pig, all that sort of stuff. And that he just really flat out misrepresented things. They think that he was controlling guys in the locker room in a negative sort of way. You know, I think he had his certain charms, Chad, over certain guys. And I think a lot of that pissed off Sean Payton, too. I, I Basically, what it is, is they viewed um, Russell Wilson as toxic behind the scenes. They did. I, I don't know how else to put it. And, and phoniness through and through. This whole, like, I'm a great teammate thing and I love everybody and all that stuff. Nobody's really buying that behind the scenes chat. I hope people re- realize and understand that. Now we've talked about all that Russell Wilson esque stuff, you know, ad nauseum. So it's wouldn't be news to listeners of this podcast or to, right. you know, one of my shows or Nate's show or your show. We talked about this for years now. And um, I'm not surprised that the Broncos couldn't help but feel that way. And for there to be an additional layer to it, I'm not surprised to hear that. Um, it's rare that somebody can be publicly that disingenuous and not be honestly that disingenuous behind the scenes. Yeah. So, you know, it's just the way it goes. I, I don't think this is breaking news or anything, uh, but it's just more of Wilson just isn't like the saint that you might think he, a, a lot of guys aren't. Okay, Chad, how else do I put it? A lot mm-hmm. of guys uh, put on a certain persona and they're they're not quite as sweet and as humble. And and you gotta wonder why. Well, why did they go with Pete Carroll instead of Russell Wilson? Why were the Broncos willing to take the 53-32 split and go with Sean Payton over Russell Wilson? Uh, you know, you don't think Russell Wilson had something to do with that? He had a lot to do with it. Um, most to do with it. And it just was a Chad, it was a locker room divided. It really was. Um, there were different camps. It was, and, and the Broncos are trying to, they're trying to change that particular culture. And I, I think good for them, man. Good for them. And, and sometimes that means you got to move on from veterans and they have um, because veterans bring in sort of a old vibe and an old personality to a, to a team. And sometimes you just need a fresh, fresh start. So that's more or less what I got. That being said, you got to understand Things are very tight-lipped around there. So a lot of the gossip that I'm getting is kind of old news, Chad. It's mm-hmm. more confirmation of what we just believed in the first place. Yeah. I, I, again, I'm not surprised to hear that. I'm not surprised to hear that the Broncos are trying to be tight-lipped. I'm not surprised that Sean, they were looking for Sean Payton to control the narrative. Sean Payton comes off the Bill Parcells tree. Bill Parcells, you know, tell me about his assistance and all their media opportunities they had to, to, to give a difference – flavor on what Bill Parcells was talking about. I've been coached by so many of those Bill Parcells guys. Yeah, they understand that there needs to be one message for the team. And it's Sean Payton's message. George Payton, while he certainly has to do the media stuff at the Combine, Sean Payton is a spokesperson for this team. Sean Payton is creating a culture to his liking, not to George Payton's liking, not to Russell Wilson's liking, to his liking. So this stuff about Russell Wilson doesn't surprise me. The stuff about, you know, being quiet about things and everyone kind of being a little bit on edge. That's also a Bill Parcells thing. It's also a Belichickian thing. Um, Even for the guys who maybe not necessarily directly involved in the coaching and the draft process, maybe it's the, the media folks or the, all those folks, everyone's tight lipped because 
There's one messenger. There's one message that will come out from this organization. So, yeah, Mel Kuyper in his idiotic mock draft has him taking a cornerback, not Knicks. He talks about Knicks quite a bit, and then he just says, ah, if Denver can look to improve a defense that ranked 30th in yards per plays allowed, uh, pair Mitchell with Patrick Sertan. I'm rolling my eyes. It's like, okay. You know, I mean, how many big catches, how many big games did receivers have? If you don't have the pass rush, and you're always trailing in games anyways, the, the you know, the effectiveness of a cornerback is so limited. I mean, you know, I, I, it takes away half the field. No, not true. Need good cornerbacks. Absolutely, definitely, Chad. But if teams have leads on you, they'll just be safe and cautious with the pass or maybe run play action to beat you over the top. And if you can't get to the quarterback, what's the difference? And, Chad, if you don't have the fucking lead, you know, teams are just going to run the ball against you anyways, mitigating the – um, you know, the, the need for a cornerback. I, I, it's not that you don't need good players, Chad, in positions, right. but you know, the degree that you need these guys. So taking a cornerback, are you fucking kidding me? I, I, I mean, it would be the most irresponsible, <laughs> stupid move the Broncos could do this year and unnecessary, but Mel's got him doing it. Cause I don't know if the hair dye has gone to his head. And that's uh, that's Mel. Meanwhile, I'll give you some other highlights. He's got Knicks and Penix going in the second round, which you know how I feel about drafting a quarterback in the second round. I think it's stupid. Can you guess what teams he has Knicks and Penix going to in the second round? I'll be super impressed if you can guess this. But take take a shot. One of them is the Raiders? Uh, it is not. Okay. Huh. I don't you'll, know. You'll probably, I'll give you one more guess, but you you probably won't get either one. But give me give uh, just to have fun, one more guess. Cowboys. That's a great guess. That is a super fun guess. It is not the Cowboys, but I respect that. He's got the Giants trading with uh Carolina to get to 33 to get Knicks. You want to talk about super stupid. Um, if you're going to go to 33, do something with the Niners or the Chiefs to get to 31 or 32 and at least give yourself, Chad, a shot at the fifth-year option. But you're going to move up in the second round if you're the Giants to get Bo Nix? You want to talk about fucking insane. You got Drew Locke there for $5 million. You got Daniel Jones with a massive cap hit. And then you're going to throw in Bo Nix? Give me a fucking break, Chad. How dumb would that be? That'd be pretty dumb, but I wouldn't be surprised. The Giants do dumb things. Um, you know, <laughs> at least recently they have. They were clearly a better managed team when they uh, won their two Super Bowls. But yes, that would be a dumb move for them. I want to go back to this corner pick for the for the Broncos. Oh, okay, sure, sure, sure. The kid from Toledo, he can play. He seems to be the consensus number two cornerback. Everyone seems to like this kid. You know, whether he's going to pan out, you know, will, that remains to be seen. But he's clearly the number two cornerback in this draft. Um, and if you're going to beat the Chiefs and you're going to go and stay pat with Jarrett Stidham, well, you ain't going to outscore the Chiefs. So you're going to have to defend them some way, somehow. So I can see some of the Mel Kuyper logic in it where he's coming from. I just think it would be a dumb pick for the Broncos to do. Oh. But but to, to Mel's point, to Mel's point, if he sees – those quarterbacks as second round talents. Do you want the Broncos to take a second round talent with the 12th pick in the draft just to get a quarterback? Well, again, we've been over this like uh, a million times. It's about the level of commitment to a guy. And like, and I'll, I'll tell you who Mel's got uh, Michael Penix Jr. going to, and that's the Rams. Uh, another like, huh? I mean, you got Stafford, you got Jimmy Garoppolo, and you got Stenson Bennett that you drafted in the fourth round. You remember him? He's yeah. like 33 years old as a college student. And, and so it's just like, and now Michael Penix, that's not a commitment. If if that were to happen, it's just like, oh, I don't know. A wasted pick when you can get a starter in the second round. Um, you were a second round pick, weren't you? Yes, 44th pick. Yeah, I think that's a, a, a great example. Like the value you had is off the charts instantly. 
as a, well, defensive player, special teams player, um, all that sort of stuff. Like you contributed right away as you should, but you're going to use a second round pick on somebody like you who can contribute right away or the fucking fourth quarterback on your roster or, or, or a guy like, when is he ever going to be able to prove himself? And this isn't baseball where you have minor leagues and a hundred rounds and you can let guys, you know, sort of stew around for two or three years before you bring them up. No, man, this is the fucking NFL. You got to go. And, then, and to me, like a second round pick on somebody that you're waiting to develop is dumb. I just think it's stupid. So well, the, okay, if you see Bo Nix being better than Stetson Bennett, who you took in the what fourth round last year, and if you've got concerns about Jimmy Garoppolo and his clear inability to stay healthy, um, is is would Sean McVay be playing chess and not checkers with that no. kind of move? Because no, he'd, be, he'd be fucking playing Connect Four. He'd be playing tic tac toe with an elephant. He, it's it's no, moronical. No, don't you dismissed Connect Four. That's a that's a man's mental game right there. Come on, Connect Four is the real deal. She'd be playing shoots and ladders. There we know. go. There you we know, go. You know, okay, but because the after the draft, there's also going to be some player movement. Guys are going to be released. If the Rams were to do this move, they're not going to go with four quarterbacks. Stetson Bennett becomes expendable. Um, maybe even Jimmy Garoppolo, because I believe he didn't sign for very much money. He becomes expendable. And wouldn't it be hilarious? Oh. If Jimmy Garoppolo is under center for the Denver Broncos because our boy Sean Payton can't get the quarterback that he wants in the draft and he just waits for one of these teams that's got a surplus after the draft and makes a deal. It wouldn't be hilarious to me. I'd want to throw <laughs> up. But if it's, I mean, it'd be hilarious because I would be beside myself if that were to happen. Anyways, that's Mel's idiotic uh, draft. And uh, yeah, man, I, I cannot abide, Mel. I'm sorry. I love you, pal. But oh, my God. Uh, I mean, I understand all the logic to it. It's just. It'd make me sick to my stomach. It really would. Listen, this is a no brainer right now. You just sit at 12. Maybe you move up to nine. I get it. You don't really have the ammo. The only way you could possibly move up to four is if the Patriots decide to do something crazy and trade with the Vikings, like trade back to 11. If the Patriots go three to 11, it's going to lessen the value of that fourth pick for the Cardinals. And they may, may be scrambling a little bit. So perhaps you could jump up, but you'd only do it if you loved JJ McCarthy, Chad. I mean, that would be it. And I don't know. Maybe they do. Maybe they don't. Hard to say, but I I know it feels more and more as we go through these mocks that at 12, you're probably going to have the choice between Knicks and Penix, and I would just sort of, I wouldn't take any risks. I would deal a third and a fourth and maybe a future third to move up from 12 to nine, something like that, and you could do it. You could definitely do it. You can With that ammo, you could go 12 to nine. The Bears should do it too. That'd be a good deal for them, and so if you're drafted at nine, then you take Bo Nix, and you tell everybody. When you move up into the top 10 to take a quarterback, Chad, you're telling fucking everybody, this is our guy. Period. The end. End of discussion. You take him at 12. It's like, all right, we like him. We might not love him, but we're going to we're gonna give it our best. And if you drop back, it's just like, ah, I will see. It, that, <laughs> that sort of thing. And I'm sick of that, man. Never mind the second round. Jesus. I mean, that is like an old pair of shoes. To go mow the lawn. I mean, it's like handy to have around, but you know, whatever. It's that sort of deal. Uh, I, I like the organizational commitment that you're talking about there. If you move up in the draft, you are clearly making an organizational commitment, and it speaks volumes versus the oh, this guy fell to us kind of thing. And it, that guy is now perceived differently in the locker room. It speaks to the organizational view of this guy. He was so important to us that we made this move. We gave up this amount of draft capital, even though we don't have very much to try to make this happen because the Broncos don't have very much early draft capital. All their stuff is back in the back end of the draft. So yeah, um, it's going to be interesting, man. It's going to be very interesting. And uh, the ever changing sands of the draft, um, mm. I think will continue to move. So while this Mel Kuyper draft is the latest, greatest for us to talk about, there'll be another one and there'll be another one after that 
before the draft actually happens and things will shift and change again. But, but right now I have a difficult time with the, seeing the Broncos get the quarterback who I think would be worthy of that 12th pick in the draft with pick number 12. Good stuff as always, Chad Brown, my man. Um, we'll be back tomorrow. Thank you to Ed Prey, the real estate, the number one trusted team in real estate in Colorado. He'll sell your home guaranteed. Couldn't do this without our guy, Ed Prather. EdPrather.com. Chad, do you have a finger update for us from your cactus prick? You know, it is significantly better. It's uh, The swelling has gone down significantly. The discoloration has gone away. I think I have, knock on wood, survived the infection possibilities. Um, you know, I just very, very lucky to get a four-inch cactus spine go through your finger. Um, you know, when, when my wife had the pliers and we were in the garage there as my hand was dripping blood, um, I didn't think a couple days later it would, it would go this well. But thank goodness, thank goodness that uh, I survived this. And my finger looks like it's going to survive too. The wife with pliers to get something out of your body is unbelievable. The first time. Unbelievable. The first time she tried to do it, the cactus spine had two layers to it. So there's an outer layer and there's the inner layer. So the outer layer came off, but it was still stuck in my hand. So then we have to make an agreement that she will pull at the same time that oh I will God. pull. Oh, it my was, God. You know, uh, I mean, I'm sure you watched uh, 127 hours. It was, it was 120 hour, 127 hours-esque uh-huh. an event in my garage. Of course, I wasn't alone. Happy she was there to help. So you're comparing pulling a thorn out of your hand to cutting off your arm in a slot canyon. Exactly, yes. Okay. And this is why we chuckle at pain. Thank you, Chad. We'll talk to you tomorrow.